one. Let's go. Let's go. You're about to experience action like you've never heard it before. Action sports, celebrities, badasses, and massive interviews. All coming to you from the Polaris Razor Studio. This is Jim Beaver's Project Action. Exclusively on Podcast One. Welcome to Jim Beaver's Project Action, super special Project Action, because sitting here in the studio with me is Miss Jolene Van Viet. Hello. Been uh, one we've been planning for a while. I've been trying to get you on since day one, and finally <laughs> I got you in Parker, Arizona for this big announcement uh, that rolled out last week, and we're going to the Mint 400, so I'm like, oh, we got to get her locked down in here, and we got to get an interview, so I'm kind of happy it's finally happening. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm stoked to finally be here and uh, have this project out in the open and get to getting into the actions to bring it to life yeah i know it's one of those things too like i you know i think i posted on my social media post where i was you know it's like 18 months in the making happy to have this out of the bag well people don't understand is literally i had this idea and i think about the time i went to polaris with it i went to you and said hey would you be interested in doing this and we're talking like i think heydays at terracross a couple two years ago right Something. yeah yeah it's definitely been a while that yeah. uh you sort of had this brainchild and i'm really stoked and just so happy that it was able to all come to light yeah so now you're going to uh, your first desert race and y <laughs> you i know like trav he went and did some baja stuff and things like that but you never have been to uh, a desert race correct i haven't no yeah the well we were filming a lot of the nitro stuff uh, you know many of the guys have been down there to do different races even uh, uh even tommy you know, you know did some racing down there at one point uh but it was just it just something that never lined up for me to get the chance to do so this is a whole new adventure for me, and I think that's what uh, drew me to it when you uh, offered up this partnership. It was just a new challenge, something I'd never done before, but involved something I had already fallen in love with. So those things to me are always a huge draw. Yeah, well, and I know uh – I know with you too, it was like, you know, to me, it was like, uh, it was perfect fit. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, but I know like you, you know, a lot of people like, oh, well, you know, sh you're like known as a bike person, but you've actually recently started doing a lot of stuff in, uh, you know, in the UTV space and things like that, you know, and I know with Terracross and, uh, you're out, I mean, when you're home, I know you've gone down to Florida, taking your UTV down there. You do a lot of stuff at Pastrana land. I mean, you're, you're all over the place with UTVs. Yeah. I definitely fell in love with, you know, the, the Razor soon as I got into it and it just sort of gave me that same thrill of racing and, and a whole new challenge. And I really enjoyed it right off the bat getting into that first Terracross race. I knew it was something that I wanted to pursue and kind of see where it could go. And then when you offered up the project, that was the perfect opportunity for me to continue to see, you know, what I had to give this sport. And so I'm very excited to, for my first um, desert race. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, and that's what happens with Project Action. We start, and I got somebody in studio, and, like, we've got all these, like, this housekeeping I got to do at the beginning of the show. We didn't even do that today. It's like, <laughs> ah, throw that shit out, out the window. So uh, those of you tuning in, this is Jim Beaver. This is Jim Beaver's Project Action. We got Miss Jolene Van Vute in studio. We got a big interview to go come with her. Uh, those of you just, uh, you know, first time tuning in, please go on iTunes. Uh, subscribe to uh, Project Action on Podcast one we're Aaron from the Polaris Razor studio and uh, make sure when you subscribe you can rate and review and don't forget uh, you listeners that do go and review uh, if you leave your Twitter uh, at username I will follow you back on Twitter if you're a listener to the show and that's how I know uh, that you're a listener is when you uh, when you tweet me and uh, you go and put that at username so uh, I got to see it on iTunes when I see it in the review I will go and follow you on Twitter and or uh, maybe Instagram will throw that in there today, too, as well. So we need some of those ratings and reviews. And, uh, man, I thank you guys that uh, I think we're up to almost like 200 reviews now. So uh, thanks to all you guys for doing that and tuning in. And don't forget to uh, download that Podcast One app. Listen to me on Tuesdays on the Down and Dirty Radio Show, also on the Podcast One network. And on, uh, I don't know, we're up to like 700 networks around the world in 177 countries. So thanks to all you guys for uh, tuning in over there. And uh, thanks to all our great uh, partners here on Project Action on Podcast One. And uh, first one, uh, got to give a big shout out to Geico. You know, everybody's got a to-do list. Drop off the dry cleaning, pick up some milk. Well, here's an idea. Let's add save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. And the good thing is you don't have to drop off or pick up anything. All you have to do is go to geico.com and in 15 minutes, you could save 15% or more on car insurance. Extra money in your pocket. It may be the most rewarding thing that you do today. 
You use Geico, don't you, Jolene? I know you got to be a Geico customer, right? I do. It's true. You can't just go on their website, <laughs> and in 15 minutes, I had my uh, my razor covered. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, how do you like that one, Geico? Like, seriously, that, uh, that one ought to pay me, like, double this week. <laughs> right? Hey. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, speaking of razors, though, I know, uh, you know, we are talking about that. I know, um, what was the moto film you did not too long ago? Um, because you were like the only person there. It, it was like one of my favorite moto films I've seen in a long time. Cause there was like Dungey and rocks. And I mean, it's like a mix of FMX and Supercross guys. And here's Jolene. And then you throw in like this uh, razor. razor. Yeah. And I was like, Oh, that is so <laughs> awesome. Like, I can't believe they let that slide in there. Like that was, yeah, that was for the, the ride United film, uh, uh, 404 films does that. And it was, they was, they were amazing. They came to Trav's house to film me and to get sort of that whole, atmospheric picture of the place that I live and train and you know so many things have go gone down there for me on dirt bikes and other things and part of you know me getting back into the game after my accident was getting back on my bike but I u also utilized sort of razors to to see where my recovery was and then it also just gave me that really cool burst of adrenaline and and reminded me how much I, I loved being in action sports and being in motorized vehicles and, and getting to do all that type of stuff. So they just really wanted to show a piece of me in the moments in which I was in. And so it was really cool that they were able to also encompass me riding my Razor. Yeah. Well, like, here's the question. I know, like, obviously you're bouncing around now. You got a lot going on. You're doing a lot of stunt work. We'll get into that in a bit. But, um, I know you mix up, especially like, you know, say you're home at Maryland at uh, Pastrana Land, right? I mean, on a daily basis, uh, are you mixing up like the dirt bike and the Razor about the same amount? Are you still riding both? Or, I mean, you like keep moving more towards the Razor, you know, now it's like. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it all just depends on what's coming down the line. What do I need the most to be the most prepared for? If, you know, if there's like with this filming, for, for instance, I knew that they were coming. So I, you know, I put my. Every, put all my effort into to riding every day just to get back to where I felt really comfortable on the bike again and I could show my confidence and show and have a good riding piece um, so that was really nice for me after everything I'd gone through to be able to get back on my bike and actually feel really confident and and back in shape again I actually felt like I could maybe go out and you know do a moto like do an actual race again after so many years of not racing motocross anymore but it was a pretty awesome experience for me and I'd actually say it was a, a good part of my recovery was just being able to get back out there and actually do a really cool piece have a have a segment out there of me showing my skills on a motorcycle yeah it's you know and I think I gotta ask you I mean this is something we'll get into but uh you know I know there for a while especially when you were on tour at Nitro I mean you were back flipping like every night and you had those things dialed where I mean I don't know how many in a row you had done at some point when was the last time you back flipped a dirt bike it's been it's been, yeah, it's been, been a been couple a, years um yeah you know I was touring with Nitro for six years there doing live shows all over the world and then the last one I got to do with Nitro was the end of the European tour in 2015. We were in Spain. And, yeah, you, I mean, I, I didn't know that would be the last time I was going to backflip with Nitro. But it was. And then uh, I haven't really gotten back to that uh, part. I've kind of started to do new things and, and see what else is out there and kind of move on to a new chapter. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things too, I think like with a backflip, I mean, like you were so good at them. Like I think people take it for granted and they, they, like you were almost like robotic because you'd done them so many times, like, oh, I'll jump on the bike backflip, you know, yeah. but I think <laughs> like, and I think, you know, that way too, like you look at a guy like Sheeny who, uh, you know, he's double and, tri you know, he's done a triple now, but he does a double so dialed, you know, that I think people forget about the danger aspect of actually going upside down. And I think it was with you with a backflip, it's like, oh, Joe Lincoln backflip. I I think you did it so well that it, it, it removed the danger. Like people didn't realize how dangerous it was what you were doing, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, that was one of the things that I always sat in awe every night at, at the shows was watching the guys out there riding freestyle and some of the stuff they're doing is just insane. I could never even imagine being, you know, capable of pulling off some of the tricks. 
And, you know, exactly like you're saying, the double with Sheeny, he just has that thing on lock, but he's worked his butt off and just got that dialed because the risk factor is so high. And that's what it takes. And, and I think people get a little jaded with freestyle motocross and don't understand how gnarly it is what those guys are doing. So I always sat there every night watching them just in, in kind of this amazement of of all their abilities and what they were throwing down it was so such a a unique cool experience and i know anybody who's ever been to the show and understands and has appreciation for freestyle motocross gets yeah well i know even like talking with a guy like ronnie feist who's become a good friend and he's like i'm so glad i made my name in fmx when i did he's (laughs) like because i got no interest in doing what these guys are doing now (laughs) he's like not to say what we did was easy but he's like to do what they're doing now he's like it's just mind-blowing he's like i'm kind of glad i was one of the pioneers and not the guys now yeah yeah because i don't want to do what they're doing for sure i mean (laughs) the upright tricks are you know they can get gnarly too and there's a finesse to really you know throwing those down well also but then there's this whole nother level when you get into doing flip tricks or get into doing you know doubles or you know what the boys are pushing with double flip tricks you know so it's like it's gnarly it's it's a whole level of crazy yeah so i one thing we've never done like and i don't know how many times i've interviewed you we've got to be into the double digits at this point i I would assume (laughs) um but we've never kind of gone back to like day one like jolene growing up and your dad and like i mean you like very much you know were a moto kid and like kind of going up through things i mean you know and your brother rode and he's a phenomenal rider you know and i don't think i don't think he's ever got his due you know what i mean (laughs) publicly because he's a phenomenally talented rider you know and it's like i mean how was it growing up because i mean it was you were very much the moto family right yeah definitely um you know I grew up playing in the dirt as a kid at motocross tracks every weekend with my family and the first sort of chapter of that I wasn't even riding I was actually just the the, you know annoying little sister playing in the dirt and uh running around and and Bill and my dad Bill and my brother Billy were the ones out on the track and but we were there as a family And that's one of the amazing things I think about growing up in the motocross community is it is a community. It is a family. So I have all those people and I have that roots and that package that really helped me kind of develop into the person I am today and into the person that was able to transition over into, you know, Nitro Circus and into doing stunts and doing um, all the different types of crazy gnarly and ridiculous things that I I have (laughs) managed to put on my resume over the years Uh, but I didn't start riding till I was 10 11 years old and you were kind of late to it then I mean there's a lot of kids starting in like three and four yeah um at the time when I started back in Ontario there wasn't a lot of girls riding to begin with I mean there was two or three women but they were maybe early 20s there was one lady that was like 41 or something so it's one of those things that I didn't see other girls my age riding to go like oh I want to go ride with them it was just a lot of you know guys it was all guys and I don't know if it just never occurred to me that it was something I could do also yeah and then when I about 10 years old I think I asked my dad like hey is this something I can do and I, he just, I, it, he just was like, well, yeah, you know, kind of like yeah. one of those, like, yeah, of course you could do it if you why you want to. And I was like, yeah, I want to give it a try. So, you know, he he busted out my my brother's old bike, and I was able to learn. I mean, I didn't catch on super fast. I think at one point I remember being on uh, in a gravel pit or something yeah. like that is where my dad took me to kind of try to get me to learn bikes, and I forgot or <laughs> where the brakes were at one point and I almost like drove off the side of this big gravel pit cliff <laughs> and I, I had to like kind of jump off the bike because I just didn't even know what I was was doing enough and I, dad standing over me shaking his head just like oh gosh what did I <laughs> what, what have I done into? here <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I was able to uh, get it, really get into it and then then I just got into doing some racing so how did that all uh i mean because i know you know you literally were one of the people i mean you know like you said when you started out there wasn't a lot of women racing motocross and still to this day like i look at you know motocross in the u.s as far as women's go and like it seems like canada has such uh 
more pronounced women, you know, national motocross, you know, f- for women. I mean, the, the U.S. We've had I don't know. There's all kinds of stories, and it's kind of been in turmoil for years here in the U.S. But you kind of got that whole thing started, right, with the women's national championship, and it's still going strong. Yeah, um, I got the idea uh, back when I was sort of in my my prime of wanting to really do something with racing and. Uh, there wasn't anything in Canada at that time. So that's when I started coming down into the States and at the time racing what was called the WML. And um, getting to be a part of that and seeing what they were doing, I then was kind of like, well, why don't we have that in Canada? Because I was trying to get sponsors and trying to sort of help fund wanting to race dirt bikes, which is, is super difficult. I mean, It's not a cheap sport to Mm -hmm. be a part of at all. And a lot of the sponsors, it was hard to get them to commit to sponsoring you as a female in Canada because you didn't have a program that benefited them, that really got their their name out there. You know, it's not like you were at a race and you could get up on the podium and say their name or anything like that. There wasn't anything that was available to Canadian women to to have the incentive for sponsors to give you product, or if you're lucky at all, some type of uh, funding program. So after being down in the States and and seeing all that, I kind of came home and went to the CMRC owner, Mark Stollybrass, and kind of had this idea like, hey, (laughs) (laughs) have you ever thought of creating a program that the women are, are able to be a part of like the men's national series where there's a couple races across the country, and then we can somehow figure out a way to get support, and maybe it can grow, and maybe eventually we can be on the roster with the men. So he, I guess, liked my idea, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we were able to kind of create something. And the first year that it, it, it went through was amazing for me. I, I was stoked. I was able to get sponsors on board and get support, and... I I got the national title that year too. So <laughs> <laughs> I was really happy because I felt like in a sense it was you know my my little baby that I was able to at least you know bring the concept up to Canada and then have somebody run with it and then uh, be able to take home the number one plate for that was always a special always something special that I I'm pretty proud of and pretty stoked about. Yeah. So how did uh, how did h- I mean how did the original meeting with Travis because obviously you know that there was that whole you know motocross racing and then you met Travis and things kind of steamrolled into where we're at now you know how <laughs> how did you guys originally meet because I think at the time you met too I mean Travis now he's like this international superstar he can't go anywhere and nobody doesn't r- know who he is right but at, at that time I mean Travis was still very much making a name for himself as well you know how how did that originally meeting you know kind of happen. Uh, Travis and I actually met at Loretta Lynn's, uh, the American Amateur National down there in Tennessee. And I was down there racing. My, my dad and I had both qualified to, to go down there and compete. And in the women's class, you know, you, women's class is always so cool within moto because you, you have these great women that you all have the same passion and the same drive. So um, you just kind of find like minds and great friends in that atmosphere. And I had um, my two friends, uh, Sarah Whitmore and Jessica Foster. And Tra- uh, Trav and Sarah were dating at the time, you oh, know, okay. young love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so that's how I, I met Travis was through Sarah. And then, yeah, year, years later, the three of us, Sarah, Jessica, and I were traveling with the Women's Pro cir- Circuit. And one of the races the weekend previous was above Trav's house and then the weekend after was below so we took the week in the summertime to go and hang out at the house and that just happened to be the time frame that Trav was looking to teach a female to backflip <laughs> it just kind of fell in it, your lap it right? did no it really did I mean I'd watched you know Trav's you know at, at the time I, did, I think NC1 and NC3 DVDs had had been out and obviously watched them like everybody else in the industry and you fall in love with them. You watch them a million times. And I mean, I always thought it was really cool. The, the backflip was still new to the yeah. industry as a whole for, for guys. And I just never, I don't think I ever thought like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be the girl that does that. It literally just happened by being there, 
right place, right time, or if you want to say wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but he just, you know, it was one of those, hey, do you want to jump into the foam pit? Yeah, sure. Why not? I'll give it a try. Well, you want to try a backflip? Oh, yeah, I guess I'll try that too. It was just on the mini bike at the time. But I, I mean, I gave it a go. I was, I mean, I was not perfect or good at it right off the bat, but it was something that me in general, I'm one of those people that if I'm going to commit to something or suddenly I get an idea of something I want to do, I, you know, I pretty, I'm you're good like with all in, you're, <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> you're all in. Like I'm I know good, that <laughs> I'm good with the follow through, you know? Yeah. You were definitely good. Yeah. With that. So if I was going to say like, yeah, I want to try to backflip, I was in my mind, I was like, I better land this damn thing or I'm going to, you know, yeah. beat myself <laughs> up trying. And I did, I, you know, I just kind of went for it and it took a, it was a learning curve, but I eventually landed the, the mini bike and was able to kind of celebrate that. And I don't know why, but something in me just was like, you can do this on a big bike. Like, you got this. <laughs> just tell Travis you got this, you know. And I did. I went up to Travis and I was like, hey, if you have any spare time coming up, I would love to come back and do this on a full-size motorcycle. I know I can do it if given the opportunity. And he was like, sweet, I have two days in a month. You want to come back? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yep. So my dad, my brother, and I packed up the packed up the cube van and drove down to Trav's a month after this uh, original mini bike experience. And I had two days to uh, to learn to flip, and then Trav had to leave again. And uh, so the first day was just me going into the the foam pit and trying to wrap my head around, you know, getting this 250 pound motorcycle to rotate. And I mean, I was, I was good. Then I wasn't, then I was good. Then I wasn't. And then, you know, just trying to find that consistency and trying to really just, the commitment was there. Just, you know, you had to wait for everything kind of to come together. And you can see in the video in NC3, I mean, there's even times where the, the neighbor kids were making fun of me and well, she didn't even commit, you know, like <laughs> just getting <laughs> shit left, right and center. And, um, Robert Pastrana, Trav's dad. I mean, he's he he'll be always be the one to tell you you can't do it <laughs> first. You know, just to kind of stir things up. He he likes to be a shit disturber, and he likes he likes to push people, but he uses that whole other different method instead of <laughs> encouraging you. He tells you there's no way in hell you're going to do this. Why are you even trying? And then that usually, I mean, if you're anything like Trevor and I, it usually puts a fire under your ass to be, to prove them yeah. wrong. Right. So, um, by the end of the day on Saturday, Trav said, listen, I'm going to need you to do at least six into the foam pit. Um, cons Oh, sorry. 11 into the foam pit consistently. I don't know why he picked that number, but <laughs> I don't know what that was, but yeah. So consistently in a foam pit, you need 11 and then, then you can go to dirt. He's like, but if you can't consistently, like, get it around, get it to wheels, he's like, you know, that's the end of the end of the game here. And so I woke up Saturday, uh, Sunday morning, went out to the foam pit with my dad and my brother, flipped 11 into the pit consistently, and was like, okay, I need a few more. You know, like, I was just like, had to make sure. Yeah. And then I don't, I can't even remember which one it was. I just came around and looked at my brother. And I was like, it's time to go right now. Right now I need to go to the back and I need, need to just do it and get it out of the way. I'm ready. I'm ready. And Trav had already gone back there and had got everything all set up. And that's the footage you see in the DVD of NC3 is me finally going out back and flipping. I did not land it the first time. <laughs> it took me three tries. Uh, I had a, a few hard hits with the first two, but was able to, you know, was able to nail it and it was very exciting for everybody and just a really amazing cool experience that brought a whole new world rushing towards me all of a sudden yeah and i think at this point in time i mean i think there's what has there been any other women that have flipped i mean i know tara got she didn't did she got really close right did she actually land one yeah originally uh you'll see in uh nc2 dvd that chad was you know working with sarah whitmore and tara geiger and Tara actually landed the mini bike first. Okay. She, yeah, so she she has that one claimed. And then th it was the process of moving it to the big bikes that those Tara had, you know, give it a few goes. And then I think she just didn't think it was for her. Um, so I th she never kind of follow through on, on that on with the, with the with the big bike. But um, for a long time, 
I did hold sort of that record of being the only girl that did it. But now they're actually, I don't think, I don't think there's any women flipping right yeah. now. I was going to say, I can't <laughs> think of any. I know there's been some that have kind of toyed with the idea, but nobody's ever. Yeah. No, Emma, um, Emma McFerrin, um, I don't know how many years back it was. I think it was, it took about seven years. I was sort of the only girl that had done it. And then Emma uh, McFerrin was the next girl to do it. And she did a few in Europe. Uh, she trained at Jacko Strong's place there for a while. And she was able to get him around and, and become, you know, the second girl, the first Australian girl to ever do that. And she did that. She did a few. But I, again, I think she just thought it just wasn't something for her. And she just went back to doing the, the freestyle, which she is amazing at. Yeah, and I know you guys are pretty good friends, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah she's a sweetheart, and she's so good on the on the bike and, and hitting ramps and stuff like that. So. Nice. So, uh, yeah, so that all happened, and things steamroll into Nitro, and you're on tour and flipping, and yeah, <laughs> yeah it's like, uh, yeah, it you ever did. think I mean, your career was going to go that way, or do you think you were going to be like, you know, you th you the next motocross, you know, I, I don't know. It's just I weird. don't know either. I mean, I, didn't, I never really knew what was ever going to come of, bikes I think in all honesty I didn't think I was ever going to really truly make a career on bikes just because it was difficult for one I mean having a, f a career as a pro racer is very difficult having a career as a pro racer as a female even more so and there just wasn't a lot of women that were able to kind of make that happen but I just remember having a conversation with my friend Jessica Foster and being like, how can we figure out just how to like, just to keep riding dirt bikes, you know, like it even, it wasn't even Samosa, like we loved racing, but it was just about being able to bikes for li like <laughs> that. Be Having that freedom. <laughs> yeah. And I, I never imagined in my wildest dreams, everything that's sort of come out of and come from that day that I was able to land the, you know, the first female backflip. It was like a fork in the road and, my life went in a completely different direction that I could have never dreamed of and so grateful and blessed for all the experiences that have come since then. But I, you know, I went to, went to high school, went to my prom, went to college for four years. I didn't know that. I didn't <laughs> know you, got a, you went to college, all right? I did. I, I worked at a motocross magazine out of college for two and a half years. Okay. I was an editorial layout designer, worked a nine to five, Monday to Friday, sitting behind a desk. Um, I worked on Kawasaki's website, cut and paste motorcycles up on the, on the webpage. And I mean, there was, there was all that process. I, I continued to ride dirt bikes and, you know, try to train to compete in different things while I was holding down a full-time job. And that was just because I knew the realities of it was I had to have something to go to, I, you know, to make a living, you have to have a career, but this huge part of me was still like, I just want to make bikes work, however that is. And if I have to, you know, go to school and then have a job and all that type of stuff and just ride and have fun on the weekends or ride as a hobby, then so be it. I still just wanted bikes to be a big part of my life and never thought I was going to be able to make it into a career, you know? Yeah. Well, and it's... Like you said that, like you have, and I mean, there's very few. I mean, you look at like, you know, Vicki Golden, who, you know, she's done so many things to yeah, you help shatter awesome. the glass ceiling. But, you know, talking about Tara, she's, or I say Tara, you Tara. say Tara. <laughs> um, it's but, Tara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and if you're listening to this, I still have never interviewed her in five years. And she's <laughs> tuning in, and it's like, she's one of my bucket lists. But, um, yeah, no, like you look at her, and I mean, she's bouncing all over, and she'll race works, and she'll be doing enduro cross, and it's like, you know, and, and, you know, she's been lucky to have, you know, some supporters like Red Bull and stuff like yeah. that, but there's very few women who have actually been able to, you know, carve out that niche, especially now, you know? Yeah. I mean, there, there are some extremely talented women out there, Tara, Vicky, Sarah, and, and they're the ones that are, you know, given it their all and they're still in the industry and, you know, they're still relevant in people's minds and it's just because they are, uh, you know, naturally this is who they are like it's it's a natural talent and I mean I love Tara is probably one of my favorite female motor bike riders as a whole I love watching her ride she has great style and uh 
it's just so cool to to be able to you know have those types of friends and be able to try to push through in the industry yeah. how was that when you because uh, i know you obviously had the fmx and the and the uh uh, moto background but uh just talk about the whole enduro cross thing because i know i'm uh, talking with you you're like that was the most brutal racing you've ever attempted mm-hmm. to even do you know and i know even like talking with travis he's like he's like the one thing i'll never do is try and do enduro cross because he's like i know i'll suck <laughs> well <laughs> what okay so when i came up with the bright idea that i wanted to suddenly you know go down the path of enduro cross trav just looked at me and shook his head and he's like why why do you want to do that? That doesn't look like any fun. He's like, we grew up taking the rocks and the tires and the this and the all the crap off the track so we can ride. And he's like, and now you're just putting it all on there and and it doesn't look like fun. <laughs> you know, like, he's like, you're completely ridiculous because when that kind of came all to light, I'm like, hey, do you mind if I make an enduro cross track in your backyard? You know, like, I had was trying to figure out some way to to make it all come together for me and and have somewhere to train and and yeah he just shook his head and he said you you do whatever you need to do but I think I think that's stupid <laughs> <laughs> he's still if you ask him he thinks it's that way you know he's, it's he's like it just doesn't look like any fun and I you know I don't know I just I found a lot of fun in enduro cross I I actually enjoyed the challenge of riding over, you know, massive trees and and rocks and tractor tires and having this whole, you know, big obstacle course set up that you had to maneuver through on top of racing against yeah. other people. Uh, it just, it, it, it spoke to me when I first saw it on, on TV because that was actually the first time I saw it. The first time X Games had it was the first time that I saw in that type of a arena style moto setup where that was when I was like, ooh, I want to do that next year. Yeah. I want to be in that class. You know, I definitely want to do that. And that's when I started to, you know, try to figure out how I could get myself into the program there and, and into competing in, in that sport. So that was a really fun challenge for me to suddenly just decide I wanted to race enduro cross and beat the living crap out of myself no to, interest to in going back level. there <laughs> no i i actually very much enjoy it it's it was just something i took i took a big chunk off in in nitro circus we were you know we were touring nonstop at the time and that ye- that year that x games was going to do like the world games where it was going to be four different events in the three different or the four different countries type of thing was when I was going to get the opportunity to compete yeah. and I had to take, you know, the the winter off for training and then the block of time that those four events took place. So, it was, you know, a pretty big commitment for me to to take a you know, take some time off from Nitro and and go into just this crash course training of working cuz I mean, you have to train, you know, just as hard as you would for racing motocross but then you know you ought then there's all these elements that you have to add into it that make it even more i mean your adrenaline and your heart rate is spiking the like second you go out there and you hit your first log or hit your first tire and even if you you know when you fall over you gotta pick your bike up and sometimes you're picking your bike up multiple times or getting it out from wedged in between something and i mean i went out which is some people still think (laughs) is absolutely (laughs) ridiculous but as part of my training for enduro cross, I actually would go out, drop my motorcycle, and pick it up on purpose, like repetitively. I would just <laughs> <laughs> pick it up, ride for a little bit, drop it, pick it up, ride for a little bit, drop it, because I was just like, part of enduro cross is, you know, this happens. You have to be able to manhandle your motorcycle. So I, I that was sort of my ridiculous way of learning how to manhandle my motorcycle was purposely crashing it and picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be mo- like some of the most gratifying racing and some of the most frustrating at the same time like you get over some of those obstacles and it's got to be like all right i cleared that you know but then at other times i mean like you said you're dropping your bike you're getting stuck in the rocks it's got to yeah. be so frustrating at times too yeah like some of those setup like the matrix was were always super gnarly you know trying to figure out there's you know there's that technique of of getting into them properly so that you 
can go through them as, as quickly. And I mean, I, I don't know how many times my bike got away from me and got, you know, I launched myself here, there and everywhere. And f I mean, falling in some of those boulders sometimes, oh. I mean, there's nothing fun about that. Um, unfortunately, that's one of the things that happened to me within that uh, season was um, going from Oh, crap, I can't believe I, f I forget which what the th the third the second round of the X Games we were going into the next one uh, which was Spain, and I wanted to really make sure that I you know stepped up my game so I actually drove all the way out to California from Maryland to get some extra practice at a couple of the uh, regular sanctioned enduro cross races, and I was actually doing fairly well and I just kind of tipped over weird in the uh, log kind of section and broke my ankle. So unfortunately I had to go to the final, you know, the next the next round of X Games there, busted up and, and with a bad ankle. And I, you know, I tried my best to, to race that race, but it just, when you can't, you know, put weight on your foot, there's just no possibility of really being a contender at that point. So unfortunately that's, that's how it ended for me. And then I went back, back into touring just because yeah. With the enduro cross, it was one of those things that w for me it was just about really wanting to do it, and it was a passion project almost, just to kind of see what it was like and really get into it. And I enjoyed it so much, but it cost me a lot of money, and I kind of funded that one on my own. So back to Nitro to go make some money again. <laughs> get some money back <laughs> yeah. in the bank account, right? Yeah. It's isn't that how action sports and racing works? It's like, oh, man, you're always to the next gig to be able to afford your habit. And it's like, what do they say? You can make $2 million or how to make a million dollars in racing. Start with $2 million. It's something mm -hmm. along those lines. Yeah, it's yeah, definitely. It's so, uh, yeah. And most people be like, you spend how much to go racing? I'm like, yeah, but it's <laughs> so worth it. I know, I know. Like when I, you know, think back of what the actual price, the total for me to, to race uh, all of those X Games but it, to me, it was worth it. You know, I it was something I really, really wanted to do. And I, I'm so glad that I got that experience and got to be a part of those X that those world X that was special. And as action sports athletes, I mean, X Games is sort of our be all and end all. You know, we don't really have the title of the Olympics. I mean, yeah. it's nice that some of the sports are actually starting to slowly be incorporated so that you have that, you know, that prestige. Um, but for us, X Games is the prestige, and to be able to compete in it is pretty awesome. Um, and if you can, you know, get a medal, that's that's it. Yeah, it's well, and I think that's something being said. You know, there's a lot of people, and I know I actually had this conversation with one of the guys from ESPN when uh, I was up at the uh, snow bike cross qualifier i don't know the official name snow bike racing the qualifier <laughs> for it they got, i don't know you know how x games is they got to put their their fancy name on top of everything right but he was at a conversation he's like oh you coming to aspen and i said no he's like well why not you're hosting this and everything i said made a pact to myself there was only two ways i'm going to x games and i said it's either going to be as an athlete i said or it's going to be as a hired talent being you know doing tv Hosting, or something like yeah. that and he just looked at me and he goes so you're not coming he's like we'd love to have you there and i said I said, sign me to a deal. And I said, we'll be there. I yeah. said, put, you know, put me in something. And he laughed. You know what I mean? He's like, he's like, he's like note taken. He's like, we'll see what we can do in the future, you know? And it, it was like, but it's kind of like you said, I mean, but I've always said that because it's just being an X Games athlete, it's kind of like a lot of Olympians. I mean, you know, only, you know, three people get a medal in certain disciplines every year, but there's amazing athletes and it's just a part of being, you know, it's about being a part of it, you know, yeah. representing your yeah. country and things like that. And I know even in X Games, it's so much that, you know, especially... You know, Jolene gets a, you know, if you were to get a medal in, oh, you know, Canada, it's a big deal for them, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's, uh, that's our Olympics in the, in the X Games, yeah. in uh, action sports is, is the X Games. If, if you can compete in that, it's pretty good. Yeah. You're doing so pretty good. We're going to switch gears here in a minute, talk about uh, some more present day, but I uh, got to talk about uh, blueapron.com. And, uh, yeah, you know, something uh, I've started here a couple of months back when they became an advertiser on the show. And I got to tell you, um, phenomenal cooking experience. Uh, the ingredients are uh, so fresh 
and uh, that's really what's kind of drawn me, you know, to Blue Apron. Uh, you know, they're high quality, uh, and it makes a real difference when you cook uh, cook these meals. For less than $10 a person per meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Choose from a variety of new recipes each week or let Blue Apron's culinary team surprise you. Recipes are not repeated within a year, so you'll never get bored. You can custom customize your recipes each week based on your own preferences, and Blue Apron has several delivery options, so you can choose what fits your needs. No weekly commitments, so you only get deliveries when you want them. Yeah, you don't want food stacking up at your front door, uh, so you're out of town. Well, they're not going to ship to you, so... Uh, Good stuff. Uh, each meal comes step by step, easy to follow recipe card with pre portioned ingredients and can be prepared in 40 minutes or less. Trust me, if I can cook, you can too. It's crazy. Step by step stuff. Uh, I need that. Like, literally, it's teaching a kindergartner things with me in the kitchen. So, um, Blue Apron's freshness guarantee promises that every ingredient uh, in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they'll make it right. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash my last name. That's B-E-A-V-E-R, Beaver, blueapron.com slash Beaver. That's right. I am giving you three free meals with free shipping. I'm buying you dinner for three nights, you and your family. Seriously, I'm doing it. Just go to blueapron.com slash Beaver, and you'll you'll love how good it feels, tastes, uh, to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Go to blueapron.com slash Beaver. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. And uh, so moving forward, now that uh, everybody here is uh, culinary experts, thanks to Blue Apron. I, I am not. A you are not. Expert. Oh man, I am a train wreck. Yeah. It's bad. I, I mean, I, I think I, I can get a meal on the table if I need to, but mac and cheese, grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> I can do stuff like that. You know, <laughs> I'm all right with a barbecue grill, not like street bike Tommy level at all. Yeah. Only guy I've ever met that has a barbecue endorsement. I'm like, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> how the heck does that, that work, perfect. dude? He's got, like, the barbecue grills, and he's got the meat. I'm like, dude, like. It's <laughs> his passion. I'm not kidding. I mean, that's, he absolutely loves, like, loves meat, loves cooking meat. You know, there's been, you know, a few times back home in Maryland, and, and he'll just right up in the morning, by the way, I'm preparing something for everybody this evening. And he's out there, like, spe he's, de you know, devoted his entire day to whatever it is, like, from prepping to getting it on to rotisserie. I don't even know because I don't do all that type of stuff. And then, um, you just know it tastes good, right? <laughs> I just know it tastes amazing. You know, he, everything that he puts onto it and he takes such pride in, in, in his cooking. And, uh, I mean, that's, you know, that's, what's really cool about what, you know, Tommy has kind of going down, down the pipeline and, and coming up is, you know, he's taking a passion that he has and, uh, and kind of seeing that through. So I don't know how much He's really kind of put out in the public of what he's yeah. he's got going down the lines. I know but it's going to be pretty exciting. I know I talked with him. We had him on here and he, uh, last fall, and he was talking about it. like he actually scratch makes barbecue sauce, and like he's got to that level where he's like doing. And I'm like, wow, like. But I know there's like this whole. Like, you don't really hear about it, but, like, the whole barbecue industry, there's guys that travel around to, like, these contests and things like that. Mm -hmm. and there's massive money in it. Yeah. And you don't realize it, but these guys, like, I mean, they're pulling in six figures from some of these winnings at these championships and stuff. And I'm like, wow. Like, yeah. there's this whole, like, guys are just career barbecue guys, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, yeah. And he's, you know, he's got some uh, good partnerships he's developed that are kind of, they're all going to come together to, for Tommy's new next project. So, Tommy's cool. always got a project of some sort. <laughs> we made him a rally car winner, so I just got to say. He do, he uh, he loves driving. He's actually a <laughs> very, very good driver. Oh, that was such an experience having him out to uh, that Rally America round. And I called him and said, hey, Tommy, I got a rally car. Do you want to go rally? And he's like, absolutely. And then it was like, <laughs> it was literally a circus, no pun intended, to get him, like Nitro Circus, to give him two days off. It was yeah. just kind of crazy Yeah. Um, going through all those hoops. But we got him there. And then, like, him and Travis and the whole, I mean, there was shit talk. Like, it was crazy. Crazy. Well, they, they do that well too. Yeah, but then when Tommy ended up beating Travis, like Travis knew it was going to happen, he checked out. He left. He's like, I want nowhere near this podium, you know. And it was like, it was so comedic, you know. And then, oh, and then Travis motorhome breaking down on the way home, and like it was just, yeah. But uh, 
Um, yeah, speaking of that, I mean, you know, I think one of the cool things I, I take away from Nitro is just all these friends you've got. Like, and I, I think through you, I've been able to, you know what I mean, Tommy and Travis and, uh, yeah, obviously there's Nate and, uh, I don't know, I've interviewed Cheney, but I mean, you have kind of, honestly, you opened that kind of door to all these amazing people, you know, through our, you know, our friendship and things like that. But I think that's got to be one of the, the biggest takeaways from your whole experience there is these amazing people that you've got to meet and, you know, travel with and have become family pretty much. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that, you know, if I'm going to, you know, take away from everything that I've experienced from, you know, my first moment of meeting Travis was the fact that I have all this amazing group around me now. You know, I'm supported and loved by so many great people. These these people have become my family. I mean, I live with Travis and his wife and the two little girls at their house in Maryland. You know, they're um, my goddaughters. And he's like a brother to me and same with all the rest of the guys and I am so grateful for all of those relationships that have come from us traveling the world together and getting to do and see some of the craziest gnarliest stuff go down I mean I've been a part of so many amazing world records and craziness and you know stuff that no one's ever tried before and I've I'm, I'm on that list too of stuff that you're just like what did you do you know like I was just um, trying snowcross this weekend, <laughs> for, for example. Um, the amazing uh, Kutu Motorsports brought me out to, to just, you know, lend me a sled and get out there and, and give, it, give it a go. And we were just having a conversation uh, in, in the car. And a, you know, a small Cessna kind of flew over our heads. And they're like, oh, well, well we just, I don't know why we were talking about it. And, and they're like, oh, have you ever been in one of those little airplanes? And I without even skipping a beat, I was like, oh yeah, I've jumped out of one of those before. Like not just completely on my level of conversation with somebody, but they were like, they asked me if I'd ever been in one. And I was like, yeah, I've jumped out of one, you know? And they all just kind of <laughs> looked at me like, what? And I was like, yeah, well actually I've jumped out of a Cessna, but I've also stood on top of a biplane before. And then I base jumped off of, off of that. And they still were all just looking at me like, how did this conversation go from like you do just asking talking about airplanes to then the crazy lady over here telling yeah. the story of her standing on top of one while it took off and you know Jeff Gattu just kind of shook his head at me and he's like you are just you are just nuts and yeah. and so it made me kind of laugh because I was like oh yeah I guess those conversations aren't normal you know but for me it is I mean been around the world doing such gnarly stuff with all of these amazingly talented people and I mean, it's just such a unique experience that half the time I, I always forget it's not normal. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that that is my that's my reality and my normal. Um, but when you actually just say it in a conversation uh, to somebody that doesn't live that world, they just look at you like you have uh, mud on your face. You're like, huh? Yeah. Well, and I know. <laughs> I know that's been one of the things that's been kind of weird for me uh, as we're cleaning up Jolene's spilled water bottle here. Yeah, I, I didn't skip a beat, though. I could. Yeah, you just rolled with it. I was kind of impressed there. I'm, I'm soaking wet, but I, yeah. I continue to tell my story. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Whoopsie. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, but, you know, talking about that's one of the things that uh, really the past five years kind of been kind of weird. But, you know, I can have these conversations and obviously I've got you sitting here in the office and, um, you know, or studio slash office or whatever. But it's like the people that I talk with and that are friends on a daily basis. You know what I mean? It's it's one of those things where it's been so it's kind of humbling at the same time where. You know, I, you know, and I've talked with other people, like I can be on a text, you know, on a text group with an ED 500 champion. And then at the same time, texting with Travis on something or Ken Block and, you know, or you. And it's like, um, you know, with some company's executive, you know what I mean? And like, to me, it's been so humbling. And it's like, you know, you talk about that where people, it's like they, they can't really relate. And it's, it's not bragging, but it's just so weird that once you're into this kind of lifestyle or something, it's just... Like, it, it's hard for people to kind of understand, you yeah. know what I mean? Well, everyone like, has their realities and, and their worlds and their their their, norm, their daily normals, you know, and that's what makes the world so unique is the fact that, you know, there are so many different groups of people that do different things that, you know, either the, the accountants that, you know, take care of our money, the lawyers that, you know, run this or that, the doctors that take care of us, the entertainers that entertain us, and then within the entertainment industry you have all these different types of levels of entertainment yeah. and it takes different minds for all of these things i mean 
I can't be an accountant. I can't be a lawyer. Yeah. I can't be a doctor. I'm like not good with numbers. I don't like arguing, you know, <laughs> with people. And I d- you definitely don't want me cutting you open, yeah. but I can. We don't want you cooking. We learned that too, right? You don't want me cooking. Well, <laughs> one of the reasons you probably don't want me cooking now is I lost my smell and my taste in my accident. I severed the nerves in my face. So I don't know what I'm feeding you. It could really taste horrible. And I'm just like, here, give it a try. Yeah. And then you have to pretend that you're like, oh, yeah. Jolene puts is, a pinch of garlic in delicious. there and she's like, oh, that's not enough. I can't smell it. Yeah. So you got like handfuls in there. You like, know? Mm, I don't know. Is it, <laughs> is it salty enough? You know, it, it's just horrible. So my, my cooking skills have not only like they weren't the, you know, the best in the first place, but now they've decreased tremendously <laughs> because I can't taste what I'm giving you. So my apologies if I ever have to cook for you. <laughs> But, you know, I, I can entertain. That That yeah. is something that I can do, and I can compete. You know, I, I'm a competitive person, and I love racing, um, where it, whatever that may be. And, you know, I thrive sort of within different in different categories. Um, but I enjoy it all as a whole that I'm always willing to try to find the new challenge or try to, you know, try things. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to be good at something or if I'm actually going to really enjoy it, but I always want to try and see and you know that's I think what is so cool about the world is that it just takes so many different people different places and and we're all different and it's just having a respect for everybody having a different reality and a different world and just kind of enjoying yours and having respect for everybody else's you know it's it's that's what makes the world so unique and so special and nobody has to be the same as anybody else I mean growing up I was so different (laughs) and I was a tomboy and I got picked on and I didn't you know I wasn't no I was no girly girl type of thing and I I just kind of I always felt a little out of place but I mean I feel like that you know that's okay that is actually pretty cool because you don't want to be like everybody else uniqueness is what stands out in this world and you can make a living for yourself in any avenue that you are passionate about. And so you never want to let people tell you that you can't be a certain way or you can't do something that you truly love or that you are truly passionate about. And even growing up, you know, you may struggle through always being the odd person out or different things like that. But eventually in the world, you always find your group. I think, you know, you find people that are like-minded, people that have the same passion as you, and those are the people that eventually you you will gravitate to, and you will find a way to to kind of get to the community you, you belong to, and that's what I was able to do with being a part of Nitro Circus, as I was suddenly, I felt like, oh, these people all make sense. These people are like I love being around them they there's the energy you know they get you they get me they I get them you know and it was suddenly like I just was in the the right place with the right people and that was that was something that Travis did I think for a lot of different people that were you know kind of not where maybe they thought maybe they should be he he just became this amazing driving force uh for a magnet to create nitro circus you know it was people ask all the time like oh well did you audition or like is that how people get into it and I was like no it was just about Travis you know going around and being himself you know doing things that he loves and pushing the envelope and always trying to to figure out new ways to scare the crap out of himself and through that process he just kind of found all these people that fit that that mold and fit into that world and so he you know one by one slowly started incorporating you know some people would come just kind of like a friend of a friend is the person you need to contact to to make this stunt happen and then all of a sudden that person would come for that shoot or whatever and that person clicked with the whole group and clicked with what we were doing and clicked with like the whole um what nitro circus was and what you know what nitro circus is and stands for and then all of a sudden the person was just always there. You know, they were one of the family all of a sudden. And, and that's how Nitro Circus grew. You know, it started with Trav and his cousin, Special Greg, and his best friend, <laughs> Jim DeChamp. 
you know, filming and you know, Kenny Bartram and oh, Ronnie gosh. Renner, oh, you know, Renner, like yeah. the yeah. grassroots, the old, you know, grassroots, the old dogs there. And it just started with, with all of that. And then, uh, you know, Greg Godfrey having, you know, the, the dream and, and all this. And then it just grew and grew and, and more people, the, you know, the more that, that they traveled around to do different stunts is how these other people got added into it. Which takes us kind of to uh, present day, and I know we talked about UTVs to uh, start things off, but uh, kind of circling back now, we got Mint 400 coming up. Your newest uh, something you're diving into. We got the Star yes. Car. I know. Uh, I don't know. What are you looking forward to this weekend? We so you're doing a hundred and a hundred and uh, I think six miles with me as my co-driver, and then you're yes. going to get out and. Uh, Tanner Faust is going to get in, yes. and then uh, lap three, uh, you're jumping in the driver's seat, and I'm riding with you, which kind of <laughs> got me a little bit scared here. I'm like, what am <laughs> I getting myself into? Yeah, I don't know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I need one of those things, like the what do they call them, like when you have uh, when you, one of the driver's ed cars with the brake pedal there, right? On the <laughs> faster side. <laughs> Jolene! Uh, yeah, I mean, this could get very interesting. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. I... I have dabbled in a lot of different things over the years, as, you know, people at Follow Nitro Circus may have seen. And some stuff I am really good and successful with, and other things have not ended so, you know, yeah. But let's not talk about, you know, the Pro 2 truck I once tried. So <laughs> there are You and I have <laughs> talked about that before. We well, <laughs> can go back into the archives. There's but, videos. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm I'm super super excited to kind of go through this next step and next chapter with you and with the team and with Polaris and with the Razors, um, and you know try my hand at at some desert racing. I mean, you've you've told me I'm gonna love it, so yeah, well, let's uh, see how well you really know me. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna <laughs> no, love it. Well, uh, I I think it's gonna be amazing, and I'm I'm really excited. Um, like I said, that this project has come to light for you and, and come together the way you envisioned, you know, you envisioned it. It's been your baby since day one. And I am more than honored to you, you know, you, you picked me as your partner for this project because I think it's just going to be such a great fun experience and we're going to have a great time. And I'm going to, I am so ready to learn and, and see what I can really do here in this next chapter of, uh, razor racing. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, th I think you and I, we were on the same page when I pitched it. You and I, they're the exact same age within about three months of each other. And mm -hmm. it was like one of those things where it's like, we're both to the point in our career where we just want to do fun shit mm -hmm. with fun people. I do. And, I definitely uh, do. you know, and I think that's what, you know, like we said, there's all these young guns coming up. We're yeah. like, oh, we're 36. We still got a lot left in the tank. Yeah, so. no, there's definitely, <laughs> you know, if one thing my dad has taught me is age doesn't matter, you know, young at heart for life. He's 71. He still races. And he's still always doing stuff that, you know, makes him feel young and just brings him, you know. It's hoverboarding now, oh, man. <laughs> oh, he loves that hoverboard. That is <laughs> hilarious. Uh, he made it, you know, he made it onto Rob Deerdick's show with his hoverboard there on yeah. Ridiculousness. Most he famous was, hoverboarder right? in the <laughs> world, right? Yeah. <laughs> he might be. Uh, yeah. Or the oldest, <laughs> you know, like talented hoverboard. I'm not sure. He's. He's pretty good at it, though. But, you know, he's been my hero throughout my life and, and setting this example of hard work uh, really does pay off and to follow your dreams and to be young at heart and just to really enjoy uh, a life. And, I mean, that is really what I'm – that's that's sort of my motto is I just want to go out and do things with amazing people and, and have fun and – be young as heart, at heart as long as, you know, as just be young and live and have have all these great experiences. And I'm, I'm lucky enough that I have such great people like you that are, you know, wanting to include me in, in certain things or like the Katu family who wanted to just kind of let me come out and enjoy and have fun um, trying snowcross for the first time or, you know, back so many, so many years ago when I met Trav and he just wanted to include me in his amazing unique and crazy world and i couldn't be more grateful to all these people because i have got to live one of the most unique adventurous and you know crazy lives that i couldn't have imagined ever and so. we're just getting started man. i know you know left. that's that's what it is it's as long as you can just continue to do what what makes you feel alive and makes you happy and you know pay the bills and and get by life's life's amazing and we only get one of them so make the best of it yeah, 
Absolutely. I think that's a good spot to end this on. <laughs> and uh, watch this space. We'll be back uh, next week to recap, uh, I guess, recap our uh, Mint 400 shenanigans. Woo. So, woo. all right. Bye, everybody. In order to feel comfortable that you're getting a fair price, you need pricing context, information that empowers you to feel confident. With True Car, you'll see what other people in your local market area paid for the car you want. From there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy, enjoy a more confident car buying experience. You loving that brand new Subaru WRX STI sitting in your buddy's driveway? Man, I bet he overpaid for that. Do you think he did? Man, can I afford it? I don't know. Well, True Car will let you know. You're going to know if he overpaid or not, and you're going to know if you're going to be able to afford the car. Um, from there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Using True Car, you can easily find the car that you want. True Car will show you what other people in your area paid for the car you want, just like the guy with the Subaru down the street. So now you know what the fair price is, and you are going to feel confident. You're going to get your swagger and your mojo going. Once you register, you'll see real pricing on actual inventory. The competitive pricing offered to you only by a True Car certified dealer for an actual vehicle on their lot. It's pricing you'll see before you go into a dealer so you can feel confident when you show up. True Car can connect you with a local certified dealer of your choosing and you can enjoy a quick, easy buying experience. True Car customers are more likely to enjoy a faster buying, buying process when they connect with those True Car certified dealers. And they're going to save an average of over 3000 That's 3K. Three grand. Three with three zeros behind it. $3,000 off MSRP. True Car shows their customer all the available incentives before they arrive at the dealership. No shenanigans going on here. Over 3 million cars have been sold to True Car dealers through this True Car Certified Dealer Network. And there's over 13,000 True Car Certified Dealers nationwide. 13,000. Man, it's got to be pretty easy to find a True Car dealer. Trust me, it is. So when you're ready to buy, just like me, Visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. True Car is truly a miracle for car buyers. And that is, uh, that's just my line there, but that is uh, straight truth. So we got a, uh, a quick promo plug here for some of our uh, fellow shows on Podcast One, and I'm going to be back to wrap things up here on Jim Beaver's Project Action. So far in 2017, Forbes and Podcast One have already launched three highly acclaimed shows. The interview with Steve Bertoni features the business world's most interesting names, like Adam Carolla, Twitter founder Sean Rad, and Hollywood's own Jessica Alba. So I spent a lot of my childhood in hospital and hospital bed. Under 30 with Steve Goldblum talks to the movers and shakers, like Nation Builder CEO Jim Gilliam and NFL big game winner Martellus Bennett. Guys are afraid to be themselves because of their marketing deals. And the list with Art of Charms, Jordan Harbinger. We'll get behind the scenes insight and information that doesn't make the print cut next up sports money with mike ozanian talking to team owners athletes and industry leaders about the enterprise and money behind supreme athletic competition forbes on podcast one not just entertaining informative subscribe now at itunes and don't forget to rate review and share thanks to all you guys for tuning in keeping it locked and loaded here to jim beaver's project action on podcast one we are the number one action sports and a little bit more podcast in the world. And you guys are doing it every week on a Thursday or Friday or Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever you download this. Um, but uh, thanks to you guys for all the support, man. Seeing these numbers are nuts. Um, it helps me get friends like Jolene Van Vute uh, over here to the podcast. And guys like Travis Pastrana and Ken Block. And uh, I like to hear from you guys, though. I want to know who you want on this show. I'm totally fan-driven. I love my fans. Please hit me up at JimBeaver15 and let me know where your heads are. What do you want more of? What do you want less of? Man, I haven't even touched Walking Dead and the craziness that is that show right now. I know. We're a little pop culture mixed in. But, uh, uh, I, you know, I got this Star Car project. We talked about it here. I talked about it on my other show, the Down and Dirty Radio Show, and between Jolene Van Butte, we had Tanner Faust over on that show as well as Jolene. We're going to have Tanner on this show next week. I'm just telling you, uh, we got some epic guests. Razor Stark are happening 
This weekend, MIT 400, you can track us live online. It's 915 is the race car number. Racedesert.com is going to have all the details, all the tracking info. You can watch the race online there. Or Friday from Contingency, I'll be live with my other show, the Down and Dirty Radio Show. Sarah Price, who has been a guest on Project Action, epic download numbers for her. She is my co-host, along with my buddy Jim Riley. Jim Riley races off-road trophy truck spec trucks and... He also owns a tequila company. So you're mixing in me, you're mixing in a trophy truck slash tequila company owner, and you're mixing in the fastest female in the world on four wheels in the dirt. And you know what? It's going to be one heck of a show. Throw in celebrities, badasses, drivers, personalities, and we're all doing it live from Fremont Street in downtown Las Vegas this Friday, 1130 Pacific, downanddirtyshow.com. You can catch the archive here on Podcast One over on the Down and Dirty Show um, page, but uh, it is going to be definitely good stuff. So thanks to all of you guys. Uh, Thanks to my good friend Jolene for stopping by the studio. Thanks to all our partners. Uh, True Car, Geico, BlueApron.com. Don't forget to use that code slash Beaver. Get me three free meals with free shipping, courtesy of myself. Um, you know, you want to go to rally school? I got codes for that too. Just go to, uh, just put JB Dirtfish in at checkout at Dirtfish Rally School's website. I got codes for days. Hopefully, you guys are taking advantage of them. And uh, if you haven't yet, you're listening to this podcast, regardless of where you're listening to it from, please go over to iTunes if you've got an Apple device. And uh, subscribe on iTunes to the podcast. And when you subscribe, it asks you to rate and review. Um, you know, you can rate me however you want. And if you, you don't have to leave a review, you can give me one through five stars and be done with it. But if you do give me a review, a little incentive to you, I will follow you back on Twitter or Instagram. But the only way I can do that is if you use your at username in the review. So you got to put that at username when you do the review. And uh, I will follow you back. It's the only way I know you left the review. So uh, don't do it and then tell me, oh, I forgot, man. It's pretty tough. Um, Those of you who have missed that, you can actually review a second time and leave uh, your at username in there. So just saying. But uh, thanks to all you guys for keeping it locked and loaded. I am wheels up. I'm heading to Las Vegas for the Mint 400. And uh, it's going to be a good weekend. Debut in Star Car. Hey, we got the video out in the wild now. Go and check it out on my Facebook or Polaris's or Jolene's Facebook. We got this epic video, me sliding a razor around, and uh, all kinds of details on the car, pictures, stuff like that. So social media is going to be popping at Jim Beaver 15. Jolene's going to have stuff. Polaris Razor's going to have stuff. Lots of stuff going on. Thanks to keeping it here at uh, Project Action. Thanks to all the support. And, uh, You guys have a great week. Be safe. Hope to see you at the Mint 400. If not, you know you. I'll tell you about it this next weekend. As always, game on.